I think there's a way to do Christianity that's dry and boring and stale, and the world is all too familiar with that one. And then there's a way to do it that's exciting and vibrant and, and tear-jerking and challenging, and it makes you want to cry, it makes you want to scream, it makes you want to laugh, it makes you want to weep. And that's the one that we want to offer. God will take you crazy places, and if you want to go, he'll, he'll make sure you get there. All right, if we're in 2 Timothy chapter 4, <clears throat> we began the book of 1 Timothy March 22nd of this year, and uh, the first message that came from that book was called, From Paul to Timothy, The Birth of a Disciple. 29 messages later, we're closing the book of 2 Timothy with a sermon that's titled, From Paul to Timothy, The Death of an Apostle. And Paul, uh, Mike read for us the words of Paul this morning, and I think we understand why we're calling it such. If you look again at verse 6, Paul is indicating here that he is about to die. He knows that he's at the tail end of his life. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. The drink offering in, in many ceremonies, religious ceremonies, was that last act by which um, wine would be poured out on the sacrifice. It was a final step in many religious, ceremonial, sacrificial acts. And so Paul is saying, I'm at, step, I'm at the last step. He even says, my, my departure is at hand. He is going to die soon, and he knows it. He is right now um, writing this letter from the dungeon that lies in what we would know of as the Mamertine prison. And it is a terrible dungeon. He is put there awaiting his own execution. And what's interesting is that he's been in trouble lots of times. If you remember in chapter 3, verse 11, if you look back there, he's... He's talking about his persecutions and afflictions. He says they happen at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. And he says, I endured these persecutions. And look at the end of verse 11 in chapter 3. He says, out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. And yet this time, somehow he knows that the Lord is not going to deliver him out of this one. He knows he's going to die. So the Lord came through time after time after time. And yet this time, it's not going to happen. God's going to allow Paul to die. He's well aware of that fact. And though he knows he's about to die, I think it's interesting that in his final words, there's really no sense of sorrow. You don't get any real regrets coming through in the tone of his letter here. There's only hope, if not anticipation. I mean, this guy, if you read other letters, Philippians, for example, this guy sounded kind of creepily excited to die. He knew he had a hope in heaven. So he's anticipating his death. He's expecting it. He has hope and he has peace. My question is, how can a guy have such hope and peace when he's facing his own imminent death? I mean, wouldn't that be sweet? If you and I, at the point in which we are faced with death, like face to face, like you get a phone call, it's the doctor, and they're saying, yep, the results come back, we need you to come in for a visit because I have news that I can't share with you over the phone. You're like, you just did. So you take the drive down there, you sit down, you're holding your wife's hand, or you got your children gathered around and then they drop the bomb on you. You got two weeks and you're going to be like, well, praise the Lord. Awesome. I've been looking forward to this day for quite a while now. More likely... There's going to be deep brokenness, tears, crying. Everybody's going to be on their face. It's going to be a really hard time. So how can Paul, when he's sitting in a dungeon, knowing that he's going to be executed, have such peace? Ah, yeah, I know my time of departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. There's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Not just to me, but everybody else who can't wait. I mean, what is it about this guy? I would like to have whatever it is that he has so that when my day comes, I'm okay with it. Well, Jesus told us in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that he came so that through his death he might free us who have lived our entire lives afraid of dying free us from that fear. 
So Jesus is the answer to being freed from the fear of death. And I would say that for Paul, the reason that he's able to die, or at least face death, with such peace is because, as in his own words, he kept the faith. He says, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. I, I hung on. I was a Christian and I stayed a Christian. I was obedient and I stayed obedient. I loved the Lord and I still do. I persevered. When he says, I kept the faith, I actually kept it, he's inferring there that there were many times throughout his Christian experience where it would have been really easy to let go of it. He kept it in contrast to letting go of it, which you know would be, have been a temptation to him. Paul kept the faith in contrast to so many others that Paul knew. There were so many other people in Paul's life that he had referred to in these last two books of the Bible, First and Second Timothy, people who had strayed from the faith. They didn't keep the faith, they strayed from the faith. They, quote, rejected the faith. They, quote, made shipwreck of the faith. They, quote, departed from the faith. They, quote, denied the faith. They, quote, cast off their faith. They, quote, had been found disapproved concerning the faith. I mean, of all of the people in Paul's life and over the course of his many long years of ministry, all of those that he had encountered who have strayed from the faith and abandoned the faith and cast off their faith and made shipwreck of their faith, Paul's going, not me, I kept it. I kept it. I've been a Christian. I stayed a Christian. I love the Lord. I've been loyal. Why would I fear dying? And throughout these letters, Paul has been instructing Timothy, the young man to whom he writes, to pursue the faith. He tells him to pursue the faith in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. He tells Timothy to hold fast to the faith in 2 Timothy 1, 13. He knows the importance of not letting go of the faith. How uncertain life is and how scary your future can be when you keep letting go of the faith so easily. Well, I'm a Christian today, I'm in church today, I'm reading my Bible today, I'm praying today, but tomorrow, not really. Why'd you let go? I don't know, something else came up. Why'd you let go? I don't know, sin got a hold of me. Why'd you let go? Because I didn't want it. Your future is very, very uncertain. I'll tell you this, when the day of your death is staring you in the face, where are you going to turn for hope? Where are you going to turn for confidence? Do you know where you're going? You have no assurance now. Not like Paul. Not like Paul who had full assurance that there was a crown laid up of righteousness for him in heaven because he had kept the faith. He says also in verse 6, four words in, he goes, For I am already being poured out as a drink. Already, it's happening already, he's saying. Before it, it was, he goes, I didn't expect it to come this soon. He's like, I thought I was going to live till I was, you know, 70, 80, 90, and don't we all? I'm going to live a, uh, uh, probably 100 by the time I die. We all think we're going to live to be old. Nobody expects to die tomorrow. Nobody in here is going, man, I really think I might die tomorrow. If that was the case, you probably wouldn't be here today. You'd probably be tying up loose ends. Probably be closing bank accounts or selling property or, you know, turning your video games over to a best friend. <laughs> Nobody thinks they're going to die tomorrow. The fact is, I, I could Google it, X amount of people will. And there's a percentage chance that may be you. The numbers are there. You could die. Yeah, but it won't be me. Until it's you. Paul says, it's happening sooner than I thought. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul had expected to live a longer life. Now, he's about to die what many would call a premature death. He's only in his late 60s. He's, only in his, he's still got some kick left to him. I mean, the Apostle Paul, he's got his physical health. He, he could be out there really you know, moving and shaking if he wasn't in prison. And so there's no reason to believe that he would have died in his late 60s. And so a lot of us would look at that and go, oh man, he died prematurely. But that's not the word that Paul chose to use. He didn't say, I'm prematurely being poured out as a drink offering. He 
says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I didn't expect to die this soon, but I'm certainly not dying prematurely. Life expectancy is a funny thing. I, I don't know what it is in America, probably 75-ish, something like that. But did you know that there is no such concept as life expectancy in the Bible? Like, people are supposed to live to be, you know, mid-70s, and if they die too soon, well, that was somewhat wrong, and if they live to be older, well, then they have just blessed by God. <laughs> no. There's no such thing in the Bible. Life expectancy, that idea, is a thing of the world. The Bible, listen to me, the Bible doesn't expect you to live a certain length of time before you die. It expects you to serve God before you die. And when you serve God faithfully, God takes you when He determines you're ready. I want to expound on that line of thinking. When a person gets saved, the list of works or things that they are to accomplish as a Christian are already given to them predetermined by God before they ever even became a Christian. Ephesians 2.10 says, We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So even before you got saved, God had already a list of things for you to accomplish as a Christian once you finally got around to putting your faith in Jesus. Once you put your faith in Jesus, then you set out accomplishing those good works. But listen, you don't know how long that list is. You just keep faithfully accomplishing those things one after the other. Sooner or later, the things on those lists are all accomplished. Not only are the works that a Christian is given to do, not only are they predetermined, but I'll also tell you that the death of a Christian is predetermined. The day of your death is already written in stone, Christian. Did you know that? Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die. You have an appointment with God. That appointment is called death. Now here's an interesting verse. I'm taking two ideas here. One, that the, the, the things you are to accomplish that God has given you to do as a Christian are already predetermined. Also, the day of your death is already predetermined. Now, here's, here's something that Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 4. He says, Father God, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So Jesus had his own list. And, and at the end of his life, he says, Father, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Hours later, he died. His last words on the cross? It is finished. My task list has been fulfilled. I believe it seems, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but it seems to be that the death of a Christian comes at about that time that he finally accomplishes every last work that God has ordained him to do as a Christian. And if he has accomplished all that he was commissioned to do, then his death was not premature. Whether he dies in his late 60s like Paul or in his early 30s like Jesus, that is not a premature death. He accomplished everything that God sent him forth to do. It's the man who dies without having lived a life of faith who dies prematurely. Even if that individual leaves, lives to be the ripe old age of 350, he dies prematurely if he never got around to serving Jesus. What does the length of your days on this earth matter? You have an eternity to look forward to. And we scramble down here and we shove vitamins into our bodies and we work out and we try to be as healthy as we can. Why? To prolong our life by a few days. I mean, we worry, we wring our hands about how we can, and we're surfing the web and trying to find the healthiest sites so we can, and we're just like pouring our life into this so we can try and stay alive a little bit longer and we got good health care, we got to see doctors all the time, we got to figure this out, I am so afraid of dying. And Jesus goes, can worrying about it add one day to your life? It's a rhetorical question, the answer is no. 
science and medicine have actually proven that if you do choose to worry about it all your life, that actually shortens your days. So you're shooting yourself in your own foot. And Jesus here indicates, and Paul really seems to believe this, length of days don't matter. I'm already being poured out as a drink. It's happening a little bit sooner than I thought, but really, what's the matter? I have accomplished all that was for me to accomplish. I have finished the race. I've finished it. Do you know how long a marathon is? Tw 26 miles. So, 26.2, thank you. Because those .2 are crucial. You can run 26 miles and you ain't done. And it would not be easy to run 26 miles. And even still, if you did, nobody's going to clap for you. Nobody's going to cheer for you. You're not going to get your finisher medal. You're not going to get your, you know, wreath or your flowers or the little foil cape they give you. They give you some weird stuff at the finish line, you know. <laughs> Point two, let's go. Point two. Paul says, I finished the race. I've done everything that was on my list. I've kept the faith. And I'm okay to go home. When God's will in a person's life lines up with God's will for that person in death, like it did for Paul, then you can die with peace because you know you've accomplished God's will and you're about to go to heaven and be rewarded for it. Isn't that what Paul's saying in verse 8? He's like, this is awesome. Like, I'm going to die, but I get the crown of righteousness. God's been polishing that thing for me. Don't know exactly what it is, but it's better than the Mamertine dungeon. All pain goes away, all suffering goes away, all fear goes away, worry, sin, eternity in heaven. Paul has been fighting the fight. He's been running the race, and all of the effort has now paid off because there's the finish line. And if you've ever run a marathon, and I know a couple of us have, that finish line is so sweet. So sweet. You cross that thing and you're like, <laughs> done. I'm done. I never want to run again. <laughs> In verse 9, Paul says, be diligent to come to me quickly. You remember he's writing to Timothy here. And now what he's going to do is go through a list of names that would have been very personal to Timothy as well as to Paul. And all the people of this list, all the names that he mentions here, have had a great effect on Paul's life and ministry. Some for good and some for evil. And he's going to list the good along with the evil because he needs Timothy to know, as his predecessor, that there's a little bit of both. You're going to get some really awesome people who are a great encouragement to you, a great help to you, and then you're going to get some real pricks. You're going to get some people who are a major thorn in your side. You are going to get some people who, who just make your life a living hell. He's going to give their names, too. Because these people opposed him. These people rejected him. These people abandoned him when he needed them most. So they're worth mentioning. Verse 10, he starts on a negative tone. <laughs> For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, a city. Crescens, another man, has gone to Galatia. Titus, another one, left me for Dalmatia. <laughs> Apparently, you remember how last week we were talking about how young Timothy here, as a 15-year-old, met the Apostle Paul as Paul was traveling around on his missionary endeavors, and how Timothy just got swept away in the current of another man's mission. Some other people got swept away in that current as well. Demas, Crescens, Titus. Apparently some people let themselves get swept away in the current of another man's mission like Timothy did and these guys did, only to regret it later on. See, Demas only got so far down the stream before he started a fight to get out of the water. 
Crescens and Titus, they just, they, they liked it at first. They got swept away, but then they're floating around for a little bit, and then they're looking to get out of the water, and when they do, they usually crawl right back to where they came from. For these guys, it was Thessalonica, Galatia, and Dalmatia, or at least I'm assuming it was. They probably went back to what was comfortable, back to what was familiar, back to whatever it was that they were doing before they ever met Jesus and followed Paul in the first place. People do that all the time. They come into these doors, they like the atmosphere, they're, they're challenged by the preaching. Ooh, I never heard anything like that before. They, they get a kick out of the music, and they like the coffee, and then they're here for a little bit, but pretty soon... They go, wait a second, I don't like where the current's taking me. And now they're going to fight tooth and nail to get out without getting as least wet as possible. And when they do, they're most likely going to crawl right back to whatever it was they were doing before. And I've seen this time and time and time again, especially for the fact that I'm the St. Louis County Jail Chaplain. They see people wanting Jesus and all excited about Jesus. And I'm going to follow Jesus and I just love this. And then what happens? And then I see him in there again. And they're not in there because they were following Jesus and loving Jesus and serving Jesus. It's because they were following Satan and loving themselves and serving themselves. It's not what God calls us to do. What happened? Well, I got sick of the float ride down the stream. I didn't want to go too far and I got freaked out and I panicked and I found the nearest sandbar so I could crawl out all wet and pathetic and go back to what I was doing before. It was safe. It was familiar. And I'll tell you, there's going to be a lot of sandbars in your life. Many opportunities for you to jump ship, to get out of this. People get excited about the hope of a new life. I don't know why people join, you know, join our ranks. Many different reasons. Maybe they're excited about the hope of a new life. They're sick of what sin has done to their life. Sin has ravaged them. I mean, they've been through so many boyfriends and so many girlfriends and so many drugs and so many... Ugh. I mean, I don't know what to do with my life. Well, then there's hope of a new life in Christ, and so then there's a, a bit of, you know, a glimmer of, of hope here. I mean, maybe it's because they want new friends. There's, everybody out there is a traitor. Everybody out there is an abuser. And then they get the idea that we're not. Well, I want to be friends with you guys. You seem to treat me pretty good, and you gave me some free coffee. Maybe it's because they want a new challenge. Some people are just predispositioned to conquering, and so they, they've done this and they've done that, and, then, and now there's a church, and they want to rise to the top here, and they want to, they want to be a pastor too. I want to do something in ministry. I want to be a missionary. And so they, they look at this as their avenue. Maybe they come into there because they see a chance at success and reward. I don't know what it is, but they see a group of enthusiastic Christians, enthusiastic Christians, which I would like to believe we are, and then what they do is they jump into whatever they, can, they see them doing without ever really counting the cost. What happens then is they've never considered where the river is going to take them and so they only get so far down the stream before they start to panic because they haven't really thought about whether they wanted to be in this for the long haul. But now that they're moving, they're starting to freak out and so they look for the nearest shoreline to get out on. And as, as I said, there's going to be many opportunities for everyone in this room to hop out of the water. You might be excited about it today, but then again, you may not be excited about what we're doing here tomorrow. Lots of people are going to leave the mission. Demises are never alone, are they? Demas took a few with him. In verse 11, Paul says, only Luke is with me. That's a sad testament, isn't it? Only Luke is with me. You remember earlier in one of his letters, Paul told Timothy, everyone in Asia has left me. That's bad. I mean, you got a whole continent full of people going, uh-uh. It's like, hmm. You know, I mean, a bad, bad day for you. Only Luke is with me. Go Luke. Go Luke. Right, we're gonna, this is our guy. Okay. Come next week, we're digging in and find out more about this guy. And we'll be digging into that guy for the next probably three, four years. And this is a long book. And so, anyway, Luke, Luke didn't get out of the river. Luke is with him. He hung strong. He didn't abandon the mission. What's Luke doing there? We don't know, but we can assume that he's there taking notes. He's, there, he's right there with Paul, getting all the information he can from Paul so that he can write the next book of the Bible that we're about to study next week. 
Did you know that? Luke interviewed everybody, and Luke followed Paul everywhere he went to write down everything that Paul did so that he could get an accurate account of Jesus Christ, and then he turns around and writes the Gospel of Luke. So there's Luke, as Paul's writing this letter, writing down that Paul's writing a letter. <laughs> He's journaling. Mark, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. He's useful to me for ministry. Now this is a nice story, guys. It's nice to see that Mark is mentioned here, and here's why. If you go back to Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 38, you find out that Mark and Paul used to be missionary companions and they would travel together, but there came a point when Mark, he was a younger guy, abandoned Paul in the middle of a mission trip. Just, it was too hard for him, he wanted it, he turned tail and ran. And then Barnabas was wanting to go with Paul on a missions trip and wanted to bring Mark with him. And Paul and Barnabas had a real throwdown. And Paul's like, I am not bringing your little wily cousin with. He's too skittish. He's already abandoned me once on a missions trip. Forget it. And they had a very heated discussion and they actually parted ways. Paul went and did his own thing and I don't know what these guys did. The Bible doesn't even follow them. Probably some insignificant Christian stuff. But now they've reconciled. Paul refused to take him years ago because Mark was untrustworthy. He was a hindrance to the mission. Here's a guy who had once abandoned Paul and his mission, but later repented of his lack of loyalty and in the end became useful to the ministry rather than a hindrance to the ministry. Isn't that nice? Repentance and reconciliation always makes for a happy ending. Yay is right. I mean, here you've got Demas and Titus and these guys, they jump out of the water, they want nothing to do with it, but they never repent. So these are the bad guys. And then you've got Mark, he jumps out of the water, he abandons the mission, and later rethinks things and goes, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. I need another inner tube, I'm going to get back in the water, plop, <laughs> there he goes. And he becomes useful again. Guys, there is no sin that you can commit, there is no abandonment that you can dish out to the church that can't be repented of, and you can come back any time, so long as you're repentant. So long as you leave that attitude and leave that life and leave the world behind, you can join this mission again. Mark my word on that because there are some of you in this room who will take a long hiatus. And if you ever come to your senses, be sure that if you come back repentant, you have a home here. Verse 12. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. <laughs> Tychicus. Come on, you don't have to laugh. You can call him Ty. Ty. I think this guy's an interesting individual. There's just very little said about him in verse 12, but we can infer a few things. One, he's a true servant. And here's how I know this. He's able to take direction. Paul says, I sent him to Ephesus. I told him where to go, and he went. He's a noble individual. He understood the importance of Paul's ministry and humbly subjected himself to Paul's direction in order to further Paul's cause. That's remarkable that anybody would do that. See somebody on mission and so respect the mission that that man is on subject that themselves to the direction of that man and become one who would go at his direction, jump at his bidding. And listen, I'll tell you that those kinds of people are good to have around. Paul could send him somewhere and that guy would go. He served as an extension to Paul's ministry. Very valuable because Paul, working alone, can only do so much. But if he's got guys like Tychicus around him, he can send them to carry on ministry in other parts of the world that Paul cannot himself currently go to. And I'll tell you that we need people like that around here. I, I, it's good for me to know that I have people in this church that I can send a blanket text and go, hey, can somebody go out and get this done? And I get replies. Yep, I can do it. I can't do it, but you can borrow my car. Well, I, I can't do it this week, but I can do it next week. 
It's nice to know that I've got people who if I need something to get done, I can put the responsibility on their shoulders and I can count on that getting done. Because I'll tell you, this church would not be what it is if I worked alone. Anybody who comes into here who is impressed with what we got going on, I will tell you, it's impressive because it's a collective effort. If you look around at all the work that's getting done, I'm responsible for a little slice of it. But we've got servants here. We've got titchikuses here. <laughs> we've got people here who will do what needs to be done. People who will take direction. People who trust me enough to say, oh, you need that? Okay, I'll do that for you. Humility. Value. Service. Verse 13, Paul says, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. The cloak. It's very cold and uncomfortable where Paul is at, to say the least. He's in the Mamertine prison. The, the conditions of that dungeon are notorious, by the way. You can actually go online and read what it's like. But to me, it's interesting that you have to go online to read about what it was like because Paul doesn't tell us what it was like because Paul isn't wasting ink trying to get sympathies. It's terrible down here, and the temperature is this, and it's cold and clammy, and I'm shivering and naked, and every once in a while they just flood the place with raw sewage and drown the inmates so that we can get more people in here. It's terrible. You have to read about that online. All Paul says is, I'm chilly. Can you bring my jacket? He's not a complainer. He's not looking for sympathy. He's not asking for anybody to cry for him over what doing the will of God has brought upon him. He doesn't mind. Doing the will of God was his joy. If it means getting locked in prison, oh well, that's part of the deal then. He says, especially, he says, bring the books, especially the parchments. What are these? These are his writings. These are like the Bible rough draft. These are his notes that he's... These are his journals. Oh, man. And listen, I, I don't know if you guys are journalers. I see some of you guys like taking notes and stuff. But I'll tell you, if you collectively, o over the years, if, if you journal and you keep recording all of those things that the Holy Spirit kind of brings to your mind as you study the Bible or anything like that, and you're like, ooh, that's good, and you let your mind go on that, and you, you scribble down some thoughts and stuff deeply edifying if you look back at your journals over time because it refreshes you on those moments over the course of your life where the Holy Spirit was there and the Holy Spirit was speaking to you and giving you deep insight and it's just it's, one, it's a good practice and so the Apostle Paul is going I need those books especially the parchments they're every bit as important to him as his own physical comfort he wants his coat because he's physically chilly, but he wants his books because he's spiritually thirsty. Every bit as important to him as his physical comfort is the written word, the written truth. Now, I, I think it's interesting when Paul is telling Timothy in verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly. Verse 13, bring the cloak that I left in my books. And then in verse 21, he says, do your utmost to come before winter. He keeps throwing this out to Timothy. Hey, come and visit me. Come and visit me. Hurry up. Come and visit me. Now, here's what's interesting is by asking Timothy to come and visit him, he's putting Timothy in a very dangerous position. Here's what one commentary says. Visiting a prisoner could be dangerous in that day and age. A prison visitor was no longer one of the anonymous crowd. Someone might associate the visitor with the alleged crimes of the accused. And if the prisoner, Paul, was suspected of seditious acts or words, which he was, the leaders of the Roman Empire were anxious about this. A visitor, Timothy, might be required to witness to the conversations held with the accused. The interrogation would not involve simple questioning. Thus, when early Christians obeyed Jesus and visited those who were in prison, they did more than perform an inconvenient or unpleasant act. I'll fill in the blank here. They were risking their lives. 
let down into the prison by rope, visitors only left at the pleasure of the guards. Meaning if you visited somebody in prison, they might just make you a prisoner. And knowing the conditions of the Mamertine prison, I think that when Timothy is reading those verses where Paul's saying, come and visit me, come, come visit me, I think Timothy is maybe sweating a little bit, a little nervous about that. Come before winter? Oh, geez, I was going to wait till like spring 2020. <laughs> so postpone that as long as I can. In verses 16, uh, 14 and, and, and on, uh, he talks about another uh, interesting man, Alexander the coppersmith. Apparently he did Paul much harm. Um, this man got honorable mention for his dastardly uh, deeds all the way back in the uh, first chapter of the first letter. And here Paul says, may the Lord repay him. Uh, you get the idea, don't you? May the Lord repay him. He's got it coming. It's that kind of, you know, Paul's not going to be sad when he sees God's wrath upon Alexander, in other words. And then in verse 16 he says, At my first offense no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. You, you got Alexander who resisted Paul and attacked Paul and opposed Paul, and Paul's like, Go get him, Lord. Whip him. May he be held accountable for all of that. And then he follows and goes, there was a whole lot of people who when I got into trouble, they got freaked out and they ran away from me. I don't want that to be held against them. So he's going, Alexander, he's got it coming because he knew what he was doing. These others, they, they ran away in a fit of emotion. I, God, don't, please don't hold that against them. There's a big difference here. And Paul understands that sometimes people who love the Lord sometimes get scared. And, 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 that, and that people who resist the Lord fear nothing, not even God. There's a big difference. And Paul is saying, God, please excuse those who, in a fit of passion, may have done something wrong. And, and, and they, they, they ran away because they were afraid for their lives. However, those that know what they're doing and they know it's wrong and they keep doing it anyway, hold them accountable. Let them feel your wrath. In verse 17, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, even though I was alone, so that the message might be preached fully through me and that the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And so here he gives a, a brief account of all of those things in his life, that he was confident in God throughout his life, so that, in verse 18, he can be confident in God at his death. Look what he says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. It only naturally follows that if you're confident in God while you live, you'll be confident in God when you come to die. Now, I'd say if you're confident in money while you live, what are you going to be confident when you die and you got none to come with? If you're confident in your own physical capabilities, what are you going to do when your health is lost, if you're confident in some relationship that you've got, some family, friends, some wife, girlfriend, husband, boyfriend, some, some children, some, you got, you're all wrapped up in that and that's your... What are you going to do when God takes them away? What are you going to do when that relationship crumbles? We must be confident in God while we live if we're going to be confident in God when we die. We're almost finished. But there's a few more people left on Paul's list. And I could cut it short right now, but that would be doing Paul, Timothy, and the Holy Spirit a disservice because these people mean something to Paul, to Timothy, and to the Holy Spirit. And so we look at verse 19 and we come across a couple of names there. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Prissa, meaning Priscilla in other parts of the Bible. Priscilla and Aquila. And I just find these two to be utterly charming. Priscilla and Aquila. We meet them in Acts chapter 18. We find out that they're tent makers by trade. Paul was a tent maker and they actually met at work. They happened to be Christians. They struck it up and they had a lot in common from there. They became lifelong friends. 
Priscilla and Aquila were very doctrinally sound. They had their scripture together. They actually helped to shape Apollos' theology. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Apollos, but he was, according to the Bible, quote, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. This was a guy who, in Corinth, they would bicker over who liked Apollos' teaching more. Well, I like Paul. Well, I like Apollos. No, I'm, I don't know if I... And so this guy was a dynamic Bible preacher. And yet Priscilla and Aquila came along. There's an account in the book of Acts where they came along and they actually had to correct Apollos' theology a little bit. They knew the Bible better than he did. So they were whips, man. These guys were very doctrinally sound. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned six times in the Bible in four different books of the Bible. And here's what's interesting. They're always mentioned together. Never is Priscilla mentioned without Aquila. And never once is Aquila mentioned without Priscilla. They're always together. Th these two, young, in love, married, grow old together, old, in love, married. They have a sustaining relationship that lasts forever. Also, what's interesting, of the six times they're mentioned, three times they're mentioned as Priscilla and Aquila. The other three times, Aquila and Priscilla. They're interchangeable. These guys are equally yoked. And we, we learn that just by reading about them. They worked together. They had the same job. They traveled together. They studied the Bible together. They ministered together. They served the Lord together. They taught the Bible together. They didn't live separate lives, and I think that is exemplary for us. If you, if you aspire to be married one day, marry in Christ. You do a great disservice to God if you call yourself a Christian and you marry somebody that's not. A, you're in sin. And B, you're dishonoring God's word and God's name. God would never have you do that. God wants us to serve the Lord together. Some of us were going, well, geez, I didn't know. <laughs> well, it's too late now. But by God's grace, you can become Priscilla and Aquila, can't you? You can learn to work together, serve together, love the Lord together, teach and study and cherish the scriptures together. But I will tell you this, whether you found out too late or you knew it getting in, your marriage will have difficulty that can be avoided if you will steer clear of it before it's too late. You want to be flippant about God wants out of marriage? Then go ahead and do it your way. Go ahead and hook up and see what comes of it. Disaster. Because if you can't agree on the Bible, you're not going to agree on anything. You're not going to agree on finances. You're not going to agree on how to raise kids. You're not going to agree on whether you should have kids or not. You're not going to agree on what you should spend your money on, whether you should buy a house, where you should work, what's ethical, what's immoral, what's right, what's wrong. Homeschool, public school, what should we do? I don't know. I mean, it's like, you guys need to think about this before you get into it because this is your pastor pleading with you, trying to save you from a headache. And let God's grace be deeply drunk by those who are in that right now. That God may come into that relationship and bring healing. That God may come into that relationship and set things straight. That there would be some humbling, some repenting from both sides. And that those two could become like Priscilla and Aquila and move forward in the Lord, serving Him with great joy blessing others and being blessed by others. In verse 20, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Trophimus, who is he? Well, he was one of Paul's associates. He was a godly man. He was very much like Tychicus, able to take direction. Hey, you got to stay here. I don't, I don't want to catch your uh, flu. <laughs> All right. And he stayed. So he was a faithful man. Paul didn't leave him in Miletus because he was being unfaithful. He didn't leave him there because he was being rebellious or resisting the truth. He left him there because he was sick. That's all. I think that God has a special use for sickness 
in people. He was a faithful man that God allowed to get so sick that he couldn't carry on. There was actually a, a postponement of his ministry while he recovered. And listen, I would like to believe that, that, that God has a special use for sickness. After having endured what I did for the last three days, I'd like to think there's some good in that. that God has a special use for that. And speaking personally, I can say that it does something to you when you're very, very sick. You come out of it the other end, a little more empathetic for people, a little more softened to the, the at least the, the lostness of souls. I mean, I got out of the house after a couple, because if you didn't know, I was sick, you know, last week. Um, but I got out of the house uh, after two days of just laying on the floor and went to pick up some stuff at the grocery store. And the... The air smelled so fresh, and everything was so wonderful, and I liked everybody. I mean, I didn't know who anybody was, but I just wanted to talk to strangers and hold the door for people, and it was just nice to be out. And I believe that God has a special use for sickness. In some cases, it's this, and in some cases, it's that. I mean, you can look at some very um, prominent examples throughout church history of great godly men and women who have fallen ill to the point of near death, and how God used that wonderfully. And I think that God has a special use for sickness, and we trust that he did in the life of Trophimus. In verse 21, Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. We don't know who they are, but Paul mentions them because he's investing in these relationships that he's got with these folks, even though he's about to die. And I think that's significant. He invests in the relationships he has with people right up to the very end. Why? Because he knows that his death doesn't mean the end of the relationship with these people. He's going to see him again. Might as well carry on the relationship as if we're never going to part. I'm going to be gone for a little while because, you know, they're going to cut my head off and stuff. But... I'm going to see you guys in a little bit because sooner or later somebody's going to cut your head off and we're all going to be together again and we'll cook some spaghetti and talk about it. You know, I don't know. Maybe not spaghetti if we just got our heads cut off, but maybe we'll have salad. <laughs> I don't know. And so Paul is investing in his relationships because they're that important to him and he knows that these relationships, when they're in Christ, relationships with Christians are eternal. I said it to you guys in class this morning. I'm going to know you guys forever. I'm going to hang out with you guys forever. You guys are like, ooh. And I'm like, ooh. But it'll be great because there won't be sin there. So, ooh. Yeah, right? The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul was a man of God. He served the Lord with his life many, 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 many long years. He had lots of ups and lots of downs. Saw a lot of cool things. And there was a lot of people that got swept along in the current with him. He was a very influential man. I mean, you talk 2,000 years later, he's dead for 2,000, and he's still influencing you and I. That's influence, by the way. A lot of people get swept along in his current then and now. Some people hear the things that Paul writes and they go, Ah, that's awesome, I want some of that. And some people fall away. Others will stand strong. What a temptation to compromise the message, huh? Anyone who gets involved in this mission, the mission of God, to take the truth of Jesus Christ that's been passed along to me and you and pass it along to generation next, accurately, truthfully, what temptation will there be for you and I to compromise that message? Because the pressure continues to mount against us. The pressure of the masses that want you to compromise. And yet these guys didn't. The Lukes, the Timothys, the Priscillas and Aquilas, they stood for the truth and they remained faithful regardless of the opposition. And they did it for the rest of their lives until they died. They didn't compromise like the Demas is. They didn't opt out for a comfy life like so many do today. Had they done that, there would be no church. Had these guys that we read about in the Bible and all like them, had they copped out somewhere along the way, we would still be dead in our sin. But you're not, are you? You have new life in Christ. Why? Because the godly men and women of yesterday refused to bend and they left us not with a heritage of error, but with a heritage of truth. 
Take note of what you owe them and let us pay our sons the debts we owe our fathers. If there's one thing that's missing in the lives of many Christians, it's doing something. But there's a lot of Christians out there who are living their life as a Christian with nothing to really do with it. What sets our church apart from many others, not all, but many, is that we will give you something to do with your Christianity.